exactly what we're talking about when, when we start talking about, you know, coming back to church. You know, we, we share one of, the, one of the greatest things, and I was, I was talking to a friend that I met, wow, uh, back in almost 20 years ago when I, I was working up in uh, Columbus, and I got to meet him, and and we've stayed friends on face, Facebook and uh, and everything. And and so I put out about my mom and everything. And so uh, he wrote me a, a message and was saying, you know, hey, I uh, I really want to say I'm sorry for uh, hearing about your mom and everything. But he said, you know, but one of the things that I can understand is that your mom probably was well. He's didn't say probably, he says, your mother must have been a great, very great individual because I know that because I know you. And I thought, no, I'm not a great person. But you realize a lot of things, ladies and gentlemen, and that is the Bible says to us as parents, to train up a child in the way that they should go and when they are old, they will not depart. And a lot of parents today, when you begin to talk with them and share with them about parenting, they begin to express, here's the way I believe. I believe that every child is an individual and therefore every child should make their own decisions. And so therefore, I just let them do whatever they want. Really? So let me ask you this question by a dog or, a, or have a dog or a cat and did you ever let that dog or cat do what they wanted to do they would tear up your house they would destroy everything that you've got and what we do when we allow to children to do whatever they want to do they destroy themselves and everything around them because the bible teaches us that we learn from each other the Bible says that iron sharpens iron. We need each other. And that's why we understand with church, it's a community. I know that a lot of times, maybe some of you have had an experience where you've had a rough life and you've walked into church and they judged you based upon the way you walked in, the way you looked or how you carried yourself or whatever. And, and the problem is, I am so glad that God does not judge us based upon how we look on the outside. Because if he did, some of us would be in trouble. And I'm not gonna mention any names, okay? All I can say is just look in the mirror one day and you might wanna change the mirror because you might not like what you see. We begin, we are so much better than everybody else. But let me say to you this, that none of us are better than anyone else. Every one of us are uniquely married. He's cutting in and out on me. And uh, so I've got to stay still, which is hard to do. What we need to do is we need to realize that each and every one of us are a unique creation from God. None of us are the same. And this morning, that's what we want to talk about is this. Each one of you, no matter who you are, each one of you are a masterpiece of God. He dreamed about you, thought about your characteristics, thought about how you, just you, we're going to fit into this small part of his plan that nobody else could do what you're going to do. And he's depending on each and every one of us to mold together to be part of this masterpiece. And so many times the masterpiece is not completed until all of the pieces fit together that way. And so as we talk about it, we need to understand something, and that is this. You and I, you know, but the Bible tells us that God so loved the world 
right? But the world doesn't know that. God sent his son Jesus to tell the whole world. But then Jesus and God said, here's the plan. Jesus, you're dying. And you, but your life is going to be a pattern to show how a Christian shows the love of God to the world around them. And you say, well, how am I going to do that? I'm sorry. Do you not call yourself a Christian? Which means you are Christ-like. So if the way that God showed his love was through Christ, and if we're like Christ or Christians, then the way he's doing it today, ladies and gentlemen, is showing how much he loves the world through us. It's easy to tell people that God loves them. It's easy for you to tell your children that you love them. It's easy for you to tell your spouses or your significant other or whatever that you love them in words. But until you put actions and deeds behind that, ladies and gentlemen, they are just words. And so how do we do this? It's called love and good deeds. And that's how we do this this morning. So this is National Back to Church Sunday. And there are thousands of churches across America today that are taking part in this. And during these times, praise the Lord, there's going to be a lot of celebrations Not just the people coming back to church, but people coming back to Jesus and others coming to Jesus for the first time. It's going to be a celebration like never before. And so when we begin to see all of these things, we understand that for some of you, this has been the first time in a long time that you've been in church. This is the first time you've ever been here. We're strange people. We do things different. Uh, we get finished when we get finished and, and who knows where it heads and what direction it goes into. I have notes, but sometimes the notes don't always get, get there because God says, I need you to go somewhere else. And I keep saying, okay, cool. This is good. You, you know better than me. So let's, let's go wherever you're going because you know, you know the people more than anything. But I want you to know something, ladies and gentlemen, and that is this. Your job, my job, our job is not to judge people. Our job really isn't even to lecture people. Sometimes we need to sit down and let God lecture us and tell us and let us listen to the things that we ask. And even as a church, You don't hear us standing up here and begging for money. Can we use some? Absolutely. Can we use more? Absolutely. The more we get, the more more things we can do, not not to turn on lights and all of that other stuff, but to reach out to people that are hurting and just sharing the love of, of God, you know, that are there. But what we're here for, Number one, we're here to welcome you with open arms. We're not here to say, you, you know what, um, we, we, really don't, we really don't want you here. Uh, what are you looking for? I can show you the door and show you to another church somewhere. That's not our job. Our job is to understand that God brings each and every one of you here for a reason today. He knew that you were going to be here. And he knew that you needed something out of this message. So listen to him, okay? And we'll get out of here on time. But what we also want to understand is that we want to introduce you to someone that maybe you haven't met yet. His name is Jesus. You say, well, I've never seen him. 
then you evidently haven't been looking because Jesus is seen in all of his children or his brothers, his sisters, or his bride, however you want to explain it, okay? And he's seen in those things. And the other thing is, as you turn on the TV, ladies and gentlemen, you see nothing but despair and dismay. Our kids that are going to school, I don't know about you all, I'm 70, I grew up in the, the 50s, I was just a child, but I grew up in the 60s and in the 70s. And when I went to school, I don't know about you, but I never worried, and I really wasn't ever concerned about anybody bringing a gun to school. If we ever had a difference, we fought it out on the playground. And tomorrow we came back and we hugged each other and we played together. It didn't matter whether we got our butt kicked or not. We made up and we went on. Some of the roughest fights you may have had, that person could, be, could have become your best friend. <laughs> or it could have become your spouse or your husband. <laughs> Who knows? You, you know, just preparing you for marriage. Maybe that's what it was. <laughs> but we, didn't, we weren't concerned about that. I don't know about you, but I wasn't concerned about what a part of town to be walking in. I wasn't concerned about the part of town to be driving in. I wasn't concerned about going down the road and somebody going to shoot me or shoot at me. I wasn't concerned about watching somebody die or, or overdose right in front of me on the street. There were so many things I wasn't concerned about. Now, I knew that a lot of times when Wednesday night or Thursday came along that things started getting scarce in the cupboards. But somehow, someway, our mothers always found something that they could cook so we didn't starve. I lived by the river in, day, in, in Hamilton. I don't ever remember seeing any homeless people sleeping underneath the bridge or on the banks. But today, almost every bridge that you go by or woods that you go into, you're going to find probably an encampment of homeless people. You never really were concerned that if you walked downtown there were people there begging for money. But today, our world is filled, ladies and gentlemen, with people with no hope. They don't know what's going to happen the next second, the next minute, the next hour. We get concerned about what's going to happen tomorrow, and they don't even know if they're going to see it tomorrow. And so what we as a church, and I'm not talking about a building, I'm talking about children of God, that the bride of Christ, the church. It is our job, our responsibility to bring hope to the people outside that are hurting. It doesn't mean that we've got to give them money. It doesn't mean that, but we've got to give them Jesus. Because Jesus is the only hope that they really, really can cling to. I was talking to Jim. He works at Staples. And we was talking because they're going to close the Staples here in Middletown. And I thought, well, why were they doing that? Well, you want to know why? The people that own the building are raising the rent. 
and they're trying to negotiate the rent. And they say, no, we're not going to negotiate. Here is going to be the rent. So they're moving because it, it's, they're going to move. So here's what it is. It's another vacant building that's going to sit in Middletown along with another place that's sitting over there that's vacant and a lot of other places that are vacant, houses that people are just walking away from because they can't afford them, jobs that are are being depleted day in and day out, and people have no hope. And ladies and gentlemen, we're here this morning to tell you that as the children of God, it is our job to give them hope. I can't give them a job, I can't give them money, but I can talk to them about Jesus. And when I don't, I failed. And you failed. And we all failed together. One of the things that we need to understand is for centuries, ladies and gentlemen, the church, that God has used groups of people who have followed him and dedicated themselves to him. The first hospitals, the first hospitals was not given by New York City or or Cincinnati or Hamilton or Fairfield or Middletown or anywhere else. The first churches or the first hospitals that were given around the world, ladies and gentlemen, came from the churches. And so many hospital chains today are still owned by religious organizations. God used those, that avenue, not only to bring healing to the soul, but also to bring healing to the body through the church. Not only did he do that, but also education. Today we have allowed education to be given out by the world and teaching our children values that are not godly. But let me say this to you. The first book that every school book that every child ever was taught from, ladies and gentlemen, was a book called the Bible. It taught every subject, reading, writing, and arithmetic, It taught math. It taught science. It taught literature. They used that book to instill in people not just the values of God, but the values of mankind. Because God had placed in each and every one of us his values. Values of 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 the value of life. Today, the value of life in this world is absolutely nothing. It's not unusual for a child to take a gun and just shoot somebody because they don't like them or they don't like the way they look, they don't like the way they talk, they don't like this, they don't like that. That's the way to settle it, just kill them. We forgot about talking to each other and sharing with each other. The churches were the first ones to to do food banks or homeless shelters. And people do not realize that the church has always been the first and the front of all of these things. And God has been on the move through all of this. So let me start this with a story. And then we'll grab some verses. Have you ever driven by a place where they had this beautiful stained glass windows? And they've got, you know, like those are just kind of like stained glass just kind of thrown together. You know, but they got pictures. And each, each piece fits. Well, this gentleman in the 14th century, he was an artist and he was summoned 
to make this stained glass window for this huge cathedral. And if you've ever been to Europe, and, and I love, we love to travel, and one of the places that I love is Europe. And looking at some of the 14th and the 15th and the 16th, 16th century buildings that they have, because majority of them have stained glass windows and all kinds of things, but what happened was somebody drew out a picture and they imagined what they wanted this, this stained glass window to be, okay? And so in the 14th century, they had called upon this really famous Italian um, artist and said, I need you to make this stained glass window. And what I need you to do is I need, I need it to be a, a portrait of Christ. And so he, he drew this picture, and then he started just drawing the pieces, you know, blue and red and purple and green and, and, and all of these, laying them out in, in, in this pattern. And he had all of these pieces just laying as, as, he, as he went ahead and designed it all. He had it all laying on the ground. And so what he would do is he would go over and he would pick up a piece and, and he would carefully put it in its place and, and, and molded and everything and, and, and deeply inlaid in the iron uh, and or lead uh, places that it needed to go, sealed in there and everything. And people were standing back and they were looking at it and they well, yeah. what's so spectacular about this picture? And he'd go over to the to the ground and he'd pick up another piece and put it up there and they just kept looking at it and looking at it and looking at it and they thought, what's so spectacular about this? Everybody's talking about this amazing, amazing stained glass window that this guy is just, is just putting together and I really don't see anything fantastic about it. And he kept working and there was this, this one little piece of just clear clear stained glass that it, he just had laying there and he just kept working around it and picking up the pieces and picking up the pieces and, and everybody kept wondering, okay, yeah, there's still this one little piece here. What is it all about? And so he put it all together and they looked at it and they said, okay. And they were all getting ready to walk away and he went over and he picked up that one little piece of clear glass. And he went back over to the stained glass. And on the ladder, he took this little clear piece and he placed it right where he wanted it. And when he did, the sun was shining. And all of a sudden, that whole stained glass just appeared beautiful. The stained glass is still there today. It was a portrait of Jesus. The stained glass that was clear was eye. And when the light shined through his eye, it illuminated everything. It said that's what it looks like when we look through the eye of Jesus. Everything comes to light. We see things that we ne when we thought it was just plain. He says all of a sudden you see through the eyes of Christ and everything comes to life. And everything begins to see the beauty of what God has created. And so sometimes what we need to understand, ladies and gentlemen, and that is this. Each and every one of us are small pieces of God. Amen. Looking through the eyes of Jesus. And what does he see? He sees the most beautiful creation ever when he sees us. And so, 
what we need to understand is there are some things in Hebrews chapter 10, verse 24 and 25 are the first two. And number one, what we need is positive peer pressure. Look at what he said. And let us, let us watch out for one another to provoke love and good works, not neglecting to gather together as some are in the habit of doing, but encouraging each other and all the more as you see the day approaching. Ladies and gentlemen, we need more positive peer pressure today than ever before. Why? Because I believe the day is approaching quicker. As we begin to look all around us. But the writer here, he says, let us he said, let us urge each other or let us provoke each other. And in here, he uses a word in, in, in Greek, which I won't pronounce, but I will spell for you, okay? It, it is spelled P-A-R-O, pero, pero, P-A-R-O, X-U-S-M-O-S. And it means this. It means to stimulate. Okay? That's a good word. That uh, can you bring can you bring 24 back up if you would please? The first verse. And let us watch out for one another to provoke, okay? Or stimulate, right? Okay. That's good. We're here to stimulate love or provoke. Now, generally, provoke is, <laughs> maybe I didn't want to see you. <laughs> okay. Oh, you're looking up there and it's in your way. Sorry about that. But anyway, a lot of times when we talk about provoke, we look at that as a bad way. Somebody provoke provoking us to anger or somebody provoking us to do something. And provoke is not always a bad word. Provoking love and good works. But there's another part of this word. Not only is it talking about stimulating or provoking, it is talking about irritating Getting on someone's nerves to bring about love and good works. Hmm. Most of the time when I irritate you, I don't get good works and love. I just don't feel the love. But the word also means to irritate. Remember when you ask somebody to come to church and they told you no? And you ask them again and they told you no? And you ask them again and they told you no? And you said, well, I've asked them enough. I'm just irritating them and I'll just go ahead and let them go. Don't irritate them. Get under their skin. The Bible says to irritate them to love or good works. Don't give up. You're doing your job. If they get irritated at you, praise the Lord. I don't know. I just found a new way to praise him, man. Irritate everybody. Cool. 
<laughs> I, don't, I don't have to apologize anymore for irritating you guys out of the sermon. If I irritate you, I'm just going to walk home and say, walk in my house and say, thank you, Lord, we did it again. We did it. Now let's see what kind of love and good works we're going to get out of this stuff, okay? But one of the things that he says here, he says, listen, here's what's happening. He says, not neglecting. So what? Keep irritating them so that eventually they give in and they come. Because if they give in and they come, you've done good works. You've also shown them that you loved them. Loving them means not giving up and not quitting. I hear people all the time say, you know what? I don't love you anymore. They're giving up. They're quitting. No. I am so glad that God loves me even when I'm not so good or even when I'm not so lovable. I am so glad he hasn't given up on me, that he's still provoking me and irritating me to do good works because that's what we need to do. And, and so one of the things that he does here is he's talking about all of this, but also the second part that we, we, get, that we had there was to take part in that loving and doing good deeds. And sometimes we just don't do that and do that enough. I found a story that a gentleman by the name of Trevor Miller gave an illustration that he was pastoring a, a church. And one day there was a little seven-year-old boy that walked into the Sunday school class And he walked up to his teacher and he, and he, you know, I don't know the teacher's name because he didn't give it. But he told his teacher, he says, I got a friend of mine at school. And this was on a Friday. It's one of those schools where the kids would always have, you know, breakfast, lunch during the week. And then on the weekend, they go home. And he said, I found out that my friend, when he goes home on the weekend, he doesn't have anything to eat. His mom and dad can't afford it. And so the only thing, meals that he really gets is when he comes to school here, Monday through Friday. And he asked his teacher, he says, listen, do you mind? I've got this backpack. Can we just take up some food and send him home with the backpack at the end of the class, end of the day, so that they won't go hungry? And you think about this, and I don't know if you realize it. But almost every school district around in this area, I know Middletown and Middletown is one, and I know that Fairfield is another. Where they are so great in number of the, the median income that every child gets breakfast and lunch. How do I know about Middletown? When COVID came about, we were on the school buses passing out breakfast and lunch to the kids because they weren't able to go to school to get food. We were at bus stops passing it out. Fairfield, even. Every kid in the school doesn't matter because they're so, the number's so large. 
So the little boy, they took up enough. He touched that church so that that church started a ministry. Every Friday they had backpacks filled with food so kids would not go hungry over the weekend. That was one of the greatest ministries out of that church that drew a lot to the Lord because it gave them hope that they had never seen before. It gave them love that they've never experienced. And it was just that one little boy with that one little backpack feeding a friend that changed the church. God's asking us, what can we do? The second thing we need to understand, and that is this. The reason that we serve God, ladies and gentlemen, is because of God's grace, not to earn his grace. We serve him because of what he gave us. We don't deserve his grace. You tell me how good you are, and I'll tell you how bad you are. You want to know why? Because that's who I, I understand. We've all fallen short. None of us can meet God's standards on our own, but through Christ we can. In Ephesians chapter 2, uh, 8, 9, and 10, he says this. He says, For you are saved by grace through faith, and this is not from yourselves, it is God's gift, not from works so that no one can boast. For we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared ahead of time for us to do. One of the things that we need to understand, and that is this, God created us. Even though you've got a past, you know what? That past God uses to craft into your life to make you who you are so that he can show his love, his mercy, and his grace through us. So don't let anyone tell you that you are nothing because God says, you are my masterpiece. No matter what it was and all of these things, so... What it understands is this. Did you, ever, did you ever remember what it's like and how you feel when you do something for someone and they just say, you know what? Why would you do that for me? Why? And you just say, just because I love you. Do you understand that's a feeling that you get from Christ? We ask him all the time, why, why would you love me? Why would you care about me? And he says, you know what? Because I love you. I just love you. I don't see you as a broken pot. I don't see you as multiple pieces. I see you as a work of art that I've taken the pieces and molded them all together and created something beautiful. There is nothing, nothing ugly in God's creation. When we have Christ, because God sees us through the eyes of his son, not through eyes of Satan. What makes us ugly is sin. What God sees is his son. And the last one is in John chapter 13 and verse number 35. 
by this, everyone will know that you are my disciples if you love one another. Let me say this to you all. Thank you so much for coming this morning. But your being here does not make you a Christian any more than you going in your garage makes you a car. You're still a human being. And coming here doesn't make you a Christian just because you come to church. Church attendance doesn't give us salvation. But what it does is it brings us together to allow us to do good deeds and show our love together, collectively, to people out here that need to know that they're loved. That they're not just a piece of garbage to be thrown away. C.S. Lewis wrote a book that if you've never written, you should read. It's called Mere Christianity. And in this book, he says this, do not waste your time bothering whether you love your neighbor. Act as if you did. Because as soon as we do this, we find, out, we find one of the great secrets. When you are behaving as if you loved someone, you will presently come to love him. If you injure someone you dislike, you will find yourself disliking him more. If you do him a good turn, you will find yourself disliking him less. So what we need to understand, and that is this, let us not grow tired of gathering together like this. We need this. We need this. Re it's like a tune-up. Because the next six days, ladies and gentlemen, is going to be hell. You're going to turn on your TV and you're going to see everybody arguing with each other. You're going to see who's... Who said this and who said that? They're lying. They're telling the truth. We want this. We want that. I, I promise you that here's what I'll do for you. I'll do for you. I'll do for you. And let me tell you something. They can't do nothing. They're one person. I can promise you the world and give you nothing. I am not God. God can promise you life and give you everything through his son, Jesus Christ. And at the end of the day, ladies and gentlemen, all of this stuff that we're accumulating, it's burning up anyway. It's not going to be, it's worthless. At the end of the day, what God is going to measure us upon is the love that we showed each other and the example that we set before each other as to how God truly is. And that's all that matters. And so may I say to you this, and may I be the first to say to you, I'd love to see you again. Just hang out. Bring somebody else with you. And let's just enjoy all of this together. So this morning, as we continue, as Diana comes, let's pray. And then the invitation is yours. Father, we come to you this morning. We want to thank you for allowing us to have this time together. Father, to share your love, your grace, your mercy towards each other. Help us, Lord, to see you like never before the masterpieces that you're building and putting together. Help us to see the world. And God, we ask it all in your name. And amen.